Hi, everybody who's joining us virtually right now. My name is Susie Grana Ingram, and I'm a wildlife biologist with the Peoria Park District based at Forest Park Nature Center. And at Forest Park, we have a few different things that we do throughout the course of our day. One is fun things like this, working with the public and sharing our experiences with our natural world and learning from all the people we talk with about their um, interactions with nature as well. We do a bit of research learning more about the natural ecosystems that we have. And we also kind of perform the function of wildlife 911 um, occasionally, especially this time of year, late spring, early summer. We find things like baby birds that have fallen out of their nests, animals that find their way into people's homes, sometimes animals that are injured or orphaned. So we have to make the best choices about um, how to help these animals, when we should intervene, and when we should um, leave it in the hands of nature and others in the animal kingdom to, uh, to make things better. We also do a lot of work restoring natural areas, making sure our forests are healthy, uh, making sure that we don't have too many invasive species disrupting the balance of our natural communities. But what I want to talk to you about today is animals, because everybody loves animals. You can probably think of an animal that you just love. And a lot of people also have an animal that they just don't love very much. And that's okay. Uh, the important thing is that we show respect to all the animals we interact with and, uh, I want to say vice versa. How do you really know when an animal is uh, respecting you? But we can definitely know when an animal is upset with us. Since um, we are in summer reading season, which was always one of my favorite times of year as a kid and as an adult, my local library does a really good job with summer reading for people of all ages. This year on the theme, Reading Colors Your World. When we look around at all the animals in our environment, we see a lot of animals that are brown. We see a lot of animals that are gray, but sometimes we see animals that use color in really interesting and cool adaptive ways. You're probably gonna hear me say that word a lot, adaptive or adaptation. And you might know what that word means. If so, tell the person next to you and let them know how much you know about science. An adaptation is something that an animal has either as part of their body or part of their behavior that helps them survive in their particular environment. Behind me on my chair, you probably can't see it very well. I have a deer pelt. And during the course of our time together, I'm going to show you a few things that you might have questions about. For example, if you see me holding this deer pelt, you might be asking yourself, did she just hunt down and kill a deer and take its fur? Which is a reasonable thing to think. So all of the animal specimens I'm gonna show you today, when I talk about a specimen, I either mean part of an animal or an entire animal or just part of its bones, part of its fur. Um, these specimens are all real. They all came from real Illinois animals. They are not alive, although I do have a few live animals I'm going to show you today, and I think you'll be able to tell that they're alive. Um, so this deer, this is not a deer that's alive. It's just the fur. Um, I personally did not kill this animal and take its fur, but the animal did die somehow. Somehow this deer died. Most of the specimens I'm going to show you are animals that died either of natural causes. They got old, they had a heart attack, they had some kind of disease. Um, they got too cold and froze to death. That can happen. We have some pretty chilly winters here in Illinois. Maybe they had an accident like they flew into a window if they're a bird and hit the window really hard if they're a deer. Maybe they, they got hit by a car. 
very few or none of these animals were killed on purpose by a person. But we can do things like use the fur or the bones or other parts of these animals, the feathers, to learn a bit more about them. It's also helpful because I'm probably not going to be able to go outside, grab a deer, and hold it up to show you what its fur looks like. It's much easier to do that if uh, I already just have the part of the animal here. So what about the color of this pelt is helpful to a deer? It illustrates one of the most obvious ways animals use color to survive in their environment, which is camouflage. Is that a word you know? Camouflage has to do with the color, the texture, or sometimes the entire shape of an animal to blend in with its environment. And the deer can camouflage in a couple of different ways. In the summer, its coat is lighter, it's more reddish. The baby deer have spots, which kind of helps them blend in on the forest floor. It's meant to mimic the sunlight coming through the trees, making little spots on the forest floor. In winter, the deer grow a much thicker, so warmer, but also grayer coat that's less bright. It's a little more drab like this. And in winter, as you know, Illinois turns really gray, sometimes really white. This allows the deer to blend in really well with the trunks of those trees. Right now in Illinois, deer don't have a ton of predators anymore. Um, we used to have wolves. We used to have really big uh, coyotes and we still have some coyotes, um, but the deer don't really have any natural predators in Illinois anymore, but you can tell that they once did because they were really concerned about blending in with their environment. Another example of an animal in Illinois that uses camouflage is a snapping turtle. Snapping turtles can be really small um, when they're young, but they also can get a lot bigger than the shell, which is about the size of my head. Uh, Turtles in the United States are not bright colors. We do not see pink turtles, although that would be really cool. We don't see blue turtles. They're almost all brown or gray. And a lot of times their shells look very much like the rocks in the streams and lakes where they're going to be found. An animal that uses shape to camouflage well with its environment is this animal right here. You might know what this is and you might've seen one before. We do have these in Illinois, especially in late summer. You might call it a walking stick. I would call it a stick insect, but it's all the same thing. This is a true insect. It's got six legs, it's got antenna, it has three body parts. And have you ever seen one on maybe your window or the door to your house? I feel like that's a place those can sometimes hang out. If the answer is yes, you probably noticed it there because its camouflage isn't meant to blend in with a door or a window. Its camouflage is meant to blend in with trees and tall grasses and sticks. This animal is one that is actually a predator. So blending in helps it sneak up on its prey. And it also helps them avoid getting eaten by some of the bigger animals that would like to eat it. One of my favorite examples of camouflage in birds is the goldfinch. So this bright yellow bird, usually when we think about camouflage, we don't think about bright yellow. Bright yellow stands out. It doesn't really blend in. Kind of like the deer, this animal's brighter in the summer and more drab in the winter. The winter form of the American goldfinch is kind of grayish with a little bit of yellow, but not much. Uh, it helps this bird blend in with the gray and the white of the snow. 
or a little camouflage activity, I like to think about different habitats that we see. Trees are one. So this is the bark of a uh, evergreen tree. And I've got a few different animals here. The green snake would not necessarily camouflage well with the bark of this tree. It might camouflage well with the, the needles on the tree. But if I put this green snake right on this brown tree, it's pretty easy to see. Same with the little Arctic hare. Now, a lot of times bunnies, we see them on the ground. So let's put them down here. Still stands out pretty well against this tree. An animal that does a better job of blending in with tree trunks are owls. So this is the Eastern screech owl and it's brown on brown. So it's kind of more difficult to tell that an owl's there. And if you're an owl, your job is to sneak up on small mammals and hunt them. So if, if those animals can't see you or if they can't hear you, owls are also really quiet animals. You stand a better job at catching your prey. If the habitat was something different, like a lawn of grass, or on the forest floor, a lot of times this year, there's an understory of green plants growing. Our snake would fit in a little better. It could slither through that grass. It's about the same color and its prey might not be able to see it coming. Weirdly enough, it eats almost the exact same thing as the owls, but the snakes are awake during the day and the owls are awake at night. So they don't really compete with each other for food. A snowy habitat like this would be a lot better for not really the snake. Not only does the snake stand out against the white background, but snakes also don't like to be cold. So the best fit for this one would be the snowy white rabbit. I have a couple animals that I would like to show you uh, live animals that are really good examples of animals that use camouflage. So because I am talking to you from behind a screen, uh, unfortunately you won't be able to feel these animals. If they're animals that kind of give you the creeps, then maybe it's not unfortunate, right? They're in a whole different room. So the two animals that I have are that are good uh, specimens of camouflage are insects and spiders. A lot of times insects can be bright, but the insects I have to show you are not. They're animals that are well camouflaged to the underside of logs, which is where they prefer to hang out. Uh, these animals have actually a few different cool adaptations. Camouflage is just one. Our first animals I'm going to show you. Oh, well, looks like we've got the spider first. Uh, I pulled out my friend here, Toby the tarantula, and I'll let, take off the lid and let you get a better look at Toby. You may have seen him if we've brought him to the Elmwood Library before because he is a very old tarantula. We do have big, hairy spiders in Illinois. Um, you would have to go way down to the southern part of Illinois to have a chance of seeing a tarantula in the wild because tarantulas are very warm weather spiders. They don't deal with the hard freezes that we get up here in the Peoria area where I am. Uh, Toby is 10 years old, which is really old for a male spider. It's actually really old for a female spider but the males tend to live less long. Uh, we must be taking really good care of Toby here because he, uh, he's an old spider. He's not super active, but most spiders aren't super active, especially ambush spiders like Toby. Their job is to sit around and wait for insects to come up so that they can eat them. He does spin webs like all spiders, but his webs would be kind of along the floor of his environment. So along the base of his carpet right there, um, he would not spin a web like in the corner of a room, like some of our 
orb weaving spiders do. You can see I'm moving his little legs around. Uh, that might be as active as he gets, but if you get a good look, you might be able to see all eight of them. That big bulging part sticking out um, is his abdomen. The abdomen is the part that has the spinnerets at the end, the little organs that he uses to spin his web. This is a spider that you would find in northern Mexico, which is very heavily covered by desert in a lot of the regions where you would find this spider. So his texture of being kind of soft and prickly and his coloration being brown would make him camouflage quite well with the ground in the desert. Spiders do in that part of the world have a lot of predators, specifically birds like roadrunners would really like to eat a huge juicy tarantula like Toby. So his camouflage could work to protect him from being eaten. He's moving a little bit. I'm excited to see you through the computer screen, I think. Spiders don't necessarily love being like shaken around or tipped. So he might not really like facing the screen this way, but uh, we hope that he lives long enough that we're able to take him next summer to the Elmwood Library, the Wiley Library, to meet you in person. Uh, spiders don't really make any noise. So, uh, you know, it's hard to tell what he thinks of meeting other people. But I think that he's really cool because spiders are an animal that a lot of people tend to be scared of. I don't find this particular spider really scary just because I'm used to him. I've known him for 10 years. He hasn't really tried to hurt anybody. He's a really peaceful spider. Now, if you saw a spider tarantula sized in your house, you might be a little bit scared. I also don't think that's going to happen unless somebody releases a tarantula into your house. Um, but in general, I like spiders because they eat a lot of pesky little bugs that um, are fine. Pesky little bugs have a place in our environment. But one thing that's really important is that animals don't become overpopulated. If the forest was just overrun with little uh, crickets and gnats and mosquitoes and flies, we wouldn't really like that. We like these animal groups to be in balance. So predators like spiders help keep things that way. I'm going to put his lid back on for a moment so he doesn't get loose in my room and show you another animal that exhibits pretty cool camouflage, Madagascar hissing cockroaches. We have a pair here, a male and a female. They live in a big colony with a bunch of other hissing cockroaches. So they're not the only two, but the female is the big one. And in both spiders and insects, the females tend to be bigger. The male is the littler guy right here. You may be able to see the male has two bumps kind of near the top of his head. That's how we tell them apart. Whereas the female, her right here, her body is just kind of smooth from head to toe. These animals are found in rainforests where there's not a whole lot of light hitting the forest floor. So um, their dark color helps them blend in with the tree trunks on which they would be found. They're found on tree trunks because they eat rotting wood. So they're not really a threatening type of animal. They're not an animal that can bite you or sting you. They don't have wings, so they can't even fly away. Really one of their only defenses are their camouflage and the fact that they're kind of flat and they can wedge themselves in little spaces when they're feeling threatened. A cockroach would be a nice juicy snack for a lot of predator animals in Madagascar, where they're from. So they have to have some ways to defend themselves. You can kind of see them. Oh, she's coming out to say hi. 
You can kind of see her moving her little antenna around. That's the way that she senses the world best. All insects have two antennae, but not all insects have antenna that are as long as theirs. So she is using them to kind of figure out where she is, who's around. Oh, that's our guy. That's a him up there. There. Moving them around, trying to figure out, is there anything they can eat? They would eat all day if they had the choice. And they can eat a lot of things. Anything that was that is a plant or was once a plant, cockroaches can eat, which is kind of wild to think about. If they got loose here in this room where I am, they could eat paper. They could eat the carpet if it was plant-based. I'm wearing a cotton shirt. They would be able to eat that. I have an orange in my backpack for a snack later. They'd be able to eat that. So they would be totally fine, which is one of the reasons we see cockroaches almost everywhere in the world, except parts that are frozen year round. They can kind of cling to the side of their uh, tub here like Spider-Man. Um, so you can get a good view of their undersides. Back on here. So those are a couple examples of animals that use camouflage to survive in their environment. Another reason that animals might use color to survive in their environment. Well, let's see if you can think of one. One animal that is really good at using color to send a message is our state insect, the monarch butterfly. You've probably never tried to eat a monarch butterfly, or maybe you have, I don't know, I never have. Um, monarch butterflies taste really bad. Um, they're not necessarily poisonous, but, um, well, they're not poisonous in that they kill the animal that eats them, but they can make them feel kind of sick. Um, one animal that's really learned to avoid eating monarch butterflies are blue jays. And um, blue jays will, if they try to eat them after a while, they'll learn this is not an animal I should be eating. It doesn't taste good. And it makes me feel kind of sick. So monarch butterflies use an adaptation called warning coloration. A lot of animals that use this adaptation are really bright in color. One example that we don't have in Illinois are poison dart frogs. Those are animals that are also really bright, also really unpleasant to eat. So using these bright colors is the monarch butterfly's way of saying, you don't want to eat me. I might make you feel kind of bad. Another type of coloration animals use is mimicry. A, the point of mimicry is to look like a different type of animal than you are, or maybe you wanna look like not an animal at all. On the top here, we have our old friend, the monarch butterfly. What's this animal right underneath it? I bet some of you know this. It is not a monarch butterfly, but it looks pretty similar. It's a different species called the viceroy butterfly, and it is not poisonous. In fact, it's probably super delicious to eat. Again, I don't think I'm going to be eating one anytime soon, but a lot of other animals in our environment love to eat butterflies. Uh, I think this animal looks enough like this one that if I was a predator, I would think twice before eating the harmless viceroy butterfly. So it uses mimicry through its color and patterns to look like the monarch butterfly, to trick animals into not eating it and leaving it alone. Remember earlier, we looked at the shell of the alligator snapping turtle. This is the face of that animal. And it's quite the angry looking face. I wouldn't want to mess with this turtle. At the front of its mouth, it has this little pink thing that kind of looks like a tongue. 
but it's connected in kind of a different way. What does that look like to you? This little part of the snapping turtle's mouth is meant to look like a worm. That's super weird. It's not, but whatever this little organ is, it's mimicking a worm. So the alligator snapping turtle can hang out in the water with its mouth wide open. And what are things in the water that like to eat worms? If you've ever gone fishing, you might be thinking of a fish. So a fish might swim right up to this thinking it's a worm and then the turtle can snap and eat that fish, which I think is a really wild and cool way to use mimicry. So we've learned about a few different types of coloration that can be used in an adaptive way by animals. We've learned camouflage, we've learned warning coloration, and we've learned mimicry. I'm gonna show you a few more pictures and each of these animals uses one of these tactics. Um, so we are going to play a little game. I hope you're feeling interactive. Uh, if I show you an animal that uses camouflage, cover your eyes in a you can't see me kind of way. If I show you an animal that uses warning coloration, uh, do a stop sign with your hand, warning. If I show you an animal that uses mimicry, uh, give yourself some deer antlers, pretend to be a deer. So camouflage, warning, mimicry. The first animal I'm going to show you is the hummingbird clear wing moth. This is not a hummingbird. It is a moth that looks like a hummingbird. Which one of those coloration strategies is this animal using? If you said mimicry, you're right about that one. The moth is mimicking a hummingbird. Our next one, an animal I actually really like, but you might have a different opinion, is skunk. What is the skunk doing with its colors? The white stripe on that skunk makes this animal stand out in a way that says, warning, stay away from me. And you might know that the skunk has a pretty powerful tool to keep animals away from it. Can you think of what it is? Yeah, it's their smell. If you've ever smelled a skunk, you probably aren't gonna forget it. This is an animal that looks like a bee. It's got those black and white stripes. If you look really close at its face, it has two huge fly eyes. This is actually a type of fly that's mimicking a wasp. So it's mimicry. We'll do one more. Our classic white-tailed deer in a field. Hopefully you can pick out the deer because it is really well camouflaged in its environment. Oh, all summer, when you spend time outside, look around and see if you can find examples of animals using these different coloration strategies. One that I did not talk about is um, coloration for attraction. So some animals don't use color to stay, stay away from me. They use color to say, come check me out. And a good example of this is our state bird, the Northern Cardinal. We've got the bright red male and the brighter the male is, the more attractive he tends to be to the female Cardinal over here. So it can be risky bringing a bright red bird in a green and brown forest, it makes you really stand out to things that might want to eat you like a hawk. But 
it gives the male enough of an advantage to be bright colored that they ended up being bright red birds. This is a cardinal that is a specimen, so he's not alive. Um, but you can still see he's got that bright red color. So how we use these is, again, if I wanted to look at a cardinal and I grabbed one out of the forest, it's going to get mad and it's going to fly away. A cardinal that's not alive, I can hold in my hand and look up close and study the little feathers and look at that really powerful beak that he's got in there. You might notice that his eyes are white, which is not something a live bird would have. Um, it was stuffed with cotton. So when people uh, make taxidermied birds or any animal, they take the gooey parts out, the parts that would get gross and rotten over time. And that includes the eyes. So that's why he's got cotton in his eyes instead of actual eyes. Another animal that uses coloration to attract a mate is the wild turkey. Not only does he have a fancy fan of feathers, but the male turkey, this big one right there, has a really colorful face. It has a bright blue head, a, um, a blue waddle, and he can actually make his face more colorful or less colorful. Now, when he wants to attract a female, um, those bright parts are going to be smaller. They're going to be not as bright. When a female comes near, he's going to puff up, make his face more colorful, and let that female turkey know, hey, I would be a good guy to make a nest and lay some eggs with. You um, may have in your possession, somewhere around your house, a uh, a few pipe cleaners. I think we call them chenille stems now. So uh, I just have a few random ones. And what we can do with these is a little activity. Um, we can make a little animal and it doesn't have to be a real animal. It can be a fake animal. Um, I'm going to choose brown because I have two brown ones and a yellow one. So I'll just do brown. You can make yours really colorful. You can do whatever you want. Um, this is a chance for you to maybe think about maybe camouflage. So I have brown and uh, I have a brown ledge right behind me, right? So I'm gonna make a little, you can get out yours and make something too. So I'm making a little curly caterpillar. It doesn't need to be really elaborate. Maybe I'll give it some antlers. Caterpillars don't have antlers, but it's not a real animal. So I can give mine antlers if I want. All right. My caterpillar's got some cool antlers now. If you want to, if you're watching this on YouTube and you want to pause it and work on your animal for a little while, that's okay. There's my antlered caterpillar. And I noticed that if I put him against the white wall or her, it could be her against the white wall, stands out pretty well. If I put it against the brown ledge, it's a little harder to find. I can still see it because it's not the exact same color. If I put it on my green tablecloth here, kind of stands out. If I hid this somewhere in the room, I'm in this big, big boardroom here. If I hid it somewhere and just left it, I wonder how long it would take somebody to find it. If I left it in a bright white place, it would probably really stand out. They put it in a place that was more brownish, more of the color of my little animal. It might take a while longer. So what I'm going to challenge you to do is make an animal of your own. Put it somewhere in your house or an outdoor space. You can really do this a bunch of different places where you think it might be camouflaged well. And see how long it takes somebody to find it and ask you about it. If your animal is able to camouflage really well, it could be a while before somebody even notices it, which is the whole point of camouflage. I have one more real animal to show you. And this is an animal that uses color in a way we have not talked about yet. The animal I have is our black rat snake, which you may have gotten to meet in person either 
if we brought a black rat snake to the library in the past, or if you found one in the wild, because this is the most common species of snake we see in the forested parts of Peoria County. Anyway, uh, kind of as the name would suggest, it is black in color, but only its back is black. Its stomach is actually a different color. And throughout the course of its life, the snake actually changes pattern and color. Now I'm going to grab my friend here in the red cooler, kind of like Toby Tarantula. She's also 10 years old. All right, here is Dash the black rat snake. Now, when black rat snakes are born, when they hatch out of eggs, they are brown with like some speckles and patterns on them. And as they age, they get darker and darker black. So we can still see on her body, she's got some of that pattern still from when she was a young snake. That tells us that she, I mean, she's definitely an adult, but she's not super old. Um, the older she gets, the darker black that she will get. Her little stomach has a different pattern altogether. And that's actually a common thing with snakes. Their stomach is not often seen because snakes are slithering around on their stomach. You don't really see them any other way. So it doesn't necessarily matter what color their stomach is um, because nobody ever sees that part. We see the top of the snake and her dark coloration serves a really important purpose. Uh, snakes, kind of like our friends, the spiders, do not like to be cold. All snakes that we have in Illinois hibernate during the winter because they can't deal with cold temperatures. So um, having that dark color helps her absorb sunlight. So you might have learned at some point that light colors, especially white, kind of reflect sunlight and heat, right? If you are a, wearing a dark color, like a, a dark shirt, or you're a dark colored snake, you're going to absorb more of that light, and it's going to make you warmer. For a snake, that's a good thing. Snakes love to be warm. In fact, she really likes curling up on my hand and my arm like she's doing right now because uh, humans have naturally warm body temperatures. We're usually around 98 or so degrees. I know everybody's been taking their temperature a lot lately, so you probably know exactly what temperature you tend to be. Um, so by cuddling up to me, she's actually absorbing some of the heat from my body to keep herself warm. If she was outside, slithering in the forest or in a meadow, any sunlight that's reaching the ground can be absorbed by her skin to keep her warm. If you lived in a part of the uh, world where it was warm all year long, like a lot of Australia, Northern Africa, um, much of South America, you would probably see snakes all year long snakes that don't need to hibernate because they can be warm all year. One thing you might notice is she is sticking her tongue out a lot. Um, that's how they sense their environment. Kind of like we saw the cockroaches moving their antenna around a lot. She moves her tongue around to pick up chemicals in the air and learn about her environment. She does have eyes, so she can see uh, her eyes are black, of course. So they blend into her black head, making them a little more difficult to see. Oh, she really likes the camera. Really. Um, snakes do not have ears, so she can't actually hear anything I'm saying. She can feel vibrations, so she knows that I'm talking. But as far as we know, snakes really aren't able to hear things like the sound of, of different voices. Um, they just, they just hear the vibrations. Some snakes do exhibit 
warning coloration. There are snakes that are really bright colors. Um, there are snakes that use uh, rattles on the end of their tail to warn um, that they are venomous. We don't have any snakes um, that are venomous in Peoria County, but if you travel elsewhere in Illinois, you might find some kind of like black rat snakes. Venomous snakes mostly want to be left alone. And kind of like spiders, snakes have a really important job, which is to eat rodents so that there aren't too many rodents in the world. Again, keeping that balance in nature. We do have endangered species of snakes in Illinois. The black rat snake, fortunately, is not an endangered species. Um, a lot of it has to do with losing their habitat. And um, people tend to not be so nice to snakes. I'm sure a lot of you are very nice to snakes, but some people are scared of them. And a lot of times when people are scared, they do things that aren't super nice, like hurt a snake. Um, so what what I like about this snake about Dash is that she's really gentle. And I think she's a good example of how snakes don't want to hurt people. They might be a little bit weirder and a, a little bit weirder, might be a little weird, definitely different from us, but um, their goal is not to hurt you, not to bite you. They want to eat mice and rats. They don't want to eat us. She's using her strong muscles to move around right now. Of course, she has no arms or legs, so it's all in her muscles. Snakes are really muscular animals. If you were to hold Toby Tarantula, he is super light. He weighs like nothing. But a snake, you know, she's all muscles and muscles are heavy. So picking up an adult sized snake, which I wouldn't do unless it was a pet snake or a captive snake, right? Uh, it's pretty heavy. It's kind of a workout. I wanted to share with you some resources we have. First of all, Forest Park Nature Center is open for hiking uh, every day of the year from dawn until dusk. We are renovating our visitor's center, which should be open soon. So we'll have some cool new things to see in there, uh, including all these wonderful animals that I'm showing you and a few more. Um, in the Peoria Park District, we have a lot of other great parks and natural areas to explore. Um, a lot of these are stroller accessible, wheelchair accessible. We have flat paths, we have hilly paths. So you can choose the adventure that is right for you. I also have given your wonderful library staff a little worksheet to go along with what we talked about today about colorful creatures of Illinois, including some opportunities to learn more about our natural world with Forest Park Nature Center and a matching activity. Remember how we talked about some of these different animals and the types of coloration they use? See if you can match that animal with their coloration strategy, like we talked about today. And then a couple of fun coloring pages about animals that use color in specific ways. If you have any questions that I could answer for you, I would love to talk with you more. You can reach me at area code 309-686-3360, or you can send me an email at singram, S-I-N-G-R-A-M, at peoriaparks.org. If you want to learn more about what we have to offer, if you have questions about anything we talked about today, or if you ever see something in the natural world, a cool animal, a weird animal, animals behaving in a way that you had never seen before, um, a wildflower that you can't identify, that is what we're here for. So please reach out. Thank you so much for uh, letting me share with you some of my favorite cool colored animals. And I hope to talk with you again sometime soon. That was perfect. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, I'm going to stop.